know her a little bit last year um, when we were in life group together and just hearing her story and hearing just who she is, it just will blow your mind. Um, she's 23 years old. Um, she looks just like her mom. <laughs> um, and she uh, is, uh, like we said, the, the roadie's daughter and stuff. She's a fourth child. And she's just someone who has decided to take out up on that offer of like, okay, I want to adventure no matter what that cost is. Um, and so I've just been able to have, you have the privilege to live with her this year. And just the way that she um, hum is humble before God and chooses to, to trust him even through the hardest times um, while working with Harvest Bridge, which she was going to talk about. It is just inspiring. It inspires me every day to walk with the Lord and to take more risks. And so I'm so excited to have uh, you guys to Kate Brody. redeeming your comfort zone. So I'm a little out of my comfort zone because I'm in my parents' area of ministry, not mine, so we'll see how this goes. But um, So I'll start with an, uh, an overview of just how I got into this crazy job that I do, <laughs> um, and then try to give a global perspective of the church and how we fit into that um, as a body of Christ. So I'm just praying that that'll be applicable to all of our lives. Um, I accepted Christ when I was three and a half. I still remember my mom trying to convince me to wait till I was a little bit older, till I was five, so I could make a more mature decision about it. Um, but I'm really stubborn, so I didn't do that. Um, so yeah, I, I decided to follow Jesus at that really young age. Um, late in high school, I really started to deeply question God, um, who he was, and the main reason for that wasn't just like, oh, I just have doubts. It was because I had come to know him in such a deep way. That's why I started to question him. I, I uh, was actually on a crew missions trip in Hungary when I was 16. Um, and I, that's when I really started to realize how much this life is about God's glory and not our own happiness, kind of like you were saying. Um, and so realizing that brought up a lot of questions. And uh, I'm logical, and I realized that there needs to be an answer to what's going on in this world, that there needs to be an, an explanation, essentially. Um, and so I started asking the question, like, why is there punishment for not following God? Why doesn't he at least stop natural disasters? Why does he make it so hard sometimes for people to see him clearly when they're really seeking him? So those types of questions um, really challenged me. What I also realized that was, if I came out on the other side of this like faith journey, that um, I would have to go all in, because if it's true, then the only option is to be all in. Um, and so, after reading portions of the Quran, reading atheist and Hindu writings, uh, digging really deeply into Christianity for about a year, um, I came to the conclusion that Christianity was the most logical explanation um, to the world we're living in, um, especially coming back to the person of Jesus, and just who he was, the historical support, the supports that he is who he claimed to be. Um, so after that, I was ready to go all in. Definitely had you know, issues since then, but I was very much willing to be like, okay, well, this is it. This is like, my life is gonna be about this. Um, so the summer before I went to college, God really gave me a vision to work with the body of Christ within South Asia and the Middle East specifically. And there were a lot of reasons for that, but, um, one of my favorite verses is, or two verses are 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and then 26. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer for it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So that specific passage really jumped out to me and gave me a passion to work with the established church in those areas of the world who are reaching their own people. So the, I went to Grove City College in Pennsylvania. Um, wish I had gone here, but God had other plans. <laughs> um, uh, and so my very first uh, day of college, very first class, I was in a statistics class, which I'm terrible at math, it's awful. Um, but it's crazy how math came into kind of the calling of my life. Um, we had a stats class and randomly, the professor was like, what do you wanna do with your life? He just like gave us a questionnaire and that was like the question. 
So I decided to give an actual answer, and uh, I said that I want to work with national Christians in their own countries to reach more of their own people for Christ, uh, specifically in the Middle East and South Asia. Well, it turns out that one of the finance professors at my college had a nonprofit with, like, the mission statement was almost exactly that. Um, Harvest Bridge's mission statement is coming alongside South Asian Christians to reach their own people for Christ. So, <laughs> like, pretty, I, like, I still have the email that I sent to this finance professor who is now my boss. Um, so I started volunteering, um, yeah, about, about over five years ago now. And that's what Harvest Bridge does. We partner with Christians who have done much with nothing. Pastors uh, holding church under banana trees, very popular place to start a church nowadays. Um, <laughs> going door to door to pray for their Hindu, Muslim, and Buddhist neighbors, and traveling by foot to the multiple churches that they oversee. Uh, we work in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Tibet, <laughs> Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar, um, or Burma. I went to India for the first time when I was 19 for just about two weeks, and I hated it. I hated it. I wish I could use a lesser word for that, but I hated it. It's just true. Um, and uh, Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary there in the 1800s, said, bring to you, to India, a strong sense of humor and no sense of smell. Mm-hmm. Very right. Um, but although I did not love the culture, I knew that my heart for ministry was there. Uh, I knew he was... He, God, was taking me very far out of my comfort zone, but still within my skill set, so that I could encourage and build up the body of Christ. Uh, And that's what I get to do now. Um, So I'm going to show you about like a four-minute video of Harvest Bridge and of the ministry we do there. Um, So you have a picture of just what the South Asian church looks like. The footage from this was actually taken on a trip I took in April uh, with a videographer. And so I'm going to show this to you and then um, tell a couple stories and then like and like how it applies to our lives. And one day I was taken to district officers, chief district officers office to inquiry about the church planting. I do, somebody complained there. Then he asked me why you are converting the people. I said to him that I'm not converting, I'm just telling truth to the people, but Holy Spirit converting them. And if you want to arrest, arrest Holy Spirit, I will invoke Holy Spirit right now in your table. Uh of Bhutan for the last 16 years doing ministry among the Bhutanese people who are from Bhutan. They are one of the most unevangelized people groups in the world.
love everyone in the name of Jesus. And we know, and I know, I believe God created man and woman in His image. So there is no partiality among the caste, high caste and low caste, we don't believe it. an action bag in that video if you look really closely so um i snuck into one of those shots while we're walking on accident i'm like super short so i fit very well into that into that culture um but yeah if you're christian that's your family um so the very first day i was in india i met with about 10 pastors from a state in india that's extremely persecuted um it's always been very persecuted over over history um, and I sat with these pastors who had been beaten whose uh, wives had been killed who had been imprisoned one of them had a dent in his head a very visible one um, from being beaten um, and I was 19 <laughs> when I saw that that's kind of a game changer for a 19 year old um, I saw that these men and women who have learned like they've learned that Jesus is worth it uh, that it was worth being beaten, it was worth being denied basic necessities and rights, and it was worth being rejected by family. He, Jesus, was worth it. And my gut reaction was guilt. Um, and I think that's a pretty common uh, gut reaction. Um, guilt over the easy life I live, guilt over my own lack of dedication, guilt over the fact that I didn't always feel like I could help um, in a tangible way. I've been with Harvest Bridge full time now for about two and a half years, and travel over to Asia a couple times a year, um, and then on a regular basis, I stay on top of those 250 missionaries' needs, essentially. Um, and what I've learned is that guilt is not the right reaction. Uh, it's not the response that we should have as their brothers and sisters. Instead, I've learned that these, I've let these men and women change me, um, change how I view my walk with the Lord, um, and I've tried to learn from them. One of our missionaries in Nepal, uh, her name's Joy, uh, she's about six months younger than me, so she's like barely 23. Um, and by the time she was 21, she had uh, helped plant four underground churches in Tibet because she's a boss, as Natasha would say. <laughs> um, and she also runs a children's ministry at the uh, borders of Nepal and Tibet. She's on her own. She's led about 100 adults to Christ and a lot more uh, children. Um, so she tells this story. A 32-year-old man, Dorje, was a thief. He used to steal things from people's houses, and one night he came to my house to steal. When I caught him, he tried to threaten me by showing his knife. I told him that I would not do anything to him or call the police. I shared with him the gospel of God for three hours in the night. It was 10 p.m. I preached to him until 1 a.m. At last, he knelt down and confessed all of his sins. He returned to me all of my things and promised to stop stealing. The very next day, he accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. Now he is a good Christian and has started another job and stopped stealing. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think Natasha and I would be like, let's just sit down with the guy who has a knife to our throats who just broke into our apartment and share the gospel. Well, maybe, I don't know, but probably not. I probably hit him with a pan or something, but, um, but that wouldn't be my reaction. Um, and she was, at the time, she wasn't even 20 when that happened. Um, so another, another story is one of our missionaries in the Ottoman Islands, uh, he accepted Christ when he was about 20, 21. And this is kind of his story of coming to faith and how it was worth giving up what he gave up. Um, my parents were rigid Hindus. They devoted me to many different kinds of rituals. There were no churches in our village, but I eventually came in touch with a pastor named Mark. 
and began to attend Sunday worship at his church. My parents feared that they would lose me if I became a Christian, so my father told Pastor Mark to only teach me good morals without converting me to his faith. In spite of their efforts, my regular church attendance and discipleship with Pastor Mark paved the way for me to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. My conversion created many problems in my home. My family tried to prevent me from going to church. With Pastor Mark's encouragement, however, I confronted these antagonisms for the sake of the gospel. The problems only grew. My family, family friends and the other villagers opposed, threatened, and abused me so much that I could no longer bear to live in my own village. I went to discuss these issues with Pastor Mark, but my pastor, or, but, but my parents followed me to the church and scolded both me and my pastor. They took my watch and they took my clothes right in front of Pastor Mark. They also reported to the police that their son was missing. When I found out about this, I went to the police station and told them I accepted Jesus Christ of my own free will. The policeman responded by beating me and throwing me into a dark, bug-infested jail cell. I was honored to suffer for Christ, much like Paul did. The police superintendent was a Christian, so I was released once he found out what had happened. My parents were called to the station, and they were told that they could not stop me from being a Christian, as I was then 21 years old. My father then made a document to disown me and said that I was not entitled to anything he owned. I was no longer his son. Once again, I was honored to suffer for Jesus, and I took baptism soon after. Um, so I wish that was like a rare story, but it's not. Um, that's a very normal story that I hear on a regular basis, and not just in South Asia, but in East Asia, the video is talking about all over the world, statistically, most Christians live in persecuted countries, um, the majority of Christians, which means we are the exception to the rule, uh, living in a country that accepts our religion as legal, even. Um, and so, and secondly, these are, um, oh, sorry, well, let me go back. Um, I notice how constant it is for them to be outside of their comfort, comfort zones for these uh, persecuted Christians to just be like, all right, God first, me second. Um, and I've also realized that I have a long way to go in learning to love uh, God first and love others in the deep way that I've learned from our brothers overseas. Um, and secondly, these are intense stories for us who haven't been exposed to it. They've, they're still intense stories for me, and I've you know, been kind of living in it for several years now. Um, and so... That's why I go back again, that our response is not guilt. That is not the response uh, to have. Our response to not only the persecuted persecution that Christians are facing, but to the pain in the world should be, how can I use what I have been given? That's the question that we should, we should ask. Um, we're operating with the same Holy Spirit that those missionaries have, that Apostle Paul had, that all of the greats of the Bible have. Uh, we have the same ability to impact the world in the deep way that they have. Um, exact same ability. And it's going to look a little bit different depending on who you are and what your skills are. And that's exactly how God intended it to be. Because we're part of the body of Christ. Um, <laughs> I really love 1 Corinthians 12, so we're going to go back to it again. Um, so 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7 through 7 says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The world is diverse, and its needs are diverse, which means that the jobs and skills that each believer has have to be diverse as well in order to meet the world's needs, in order to for the most people to be able to experience Christ's love. Um, we each have specific gifts and passions, but we also have certain privileges by virtue of living in America at this time in history. Um, so use what you've been given. The fact that you can speak English is like highly underrated. <laughs> like it's a huge deal that you can speak English um, and most of us speak it as our first language. Um, and that you're getting an education, that you're able to learn about faith in a relatively open way. All of those things are, are rare. Um, and these missionaries I've talked about, they can't reach your teammates for Christ. They can't reach your family for Christ. Um, and they can't utilize the education and opportunity that you have, that I have. Um, my parents have been with Athletes in Action since I was eight. 
So, uh, although I wasn't a student athlete, I have seen your insane schedules. Um, and I have like deep respect for the amount of discipline <laughs> that goes into that because I don't have that level of discipline. Um, and so I know that the way you serve God now is gonna look different than it is in five years from now. Um, and it'll continue to change in your stages of life. Um, and so uh, let what you're learning through sport, through education, through faith, let it impact you. What you're learning now, what you're experiencing now in college, let it impact you. And then build up the people around you, those you will never meet through your sport, through medicine, through business, through theology, through art, through engineering, all of those things. Um, so like our brothers and sisters overseas, use your gift for God's glory. That is what's best for you. Not to be safe, not to be happy, and not to be liked, but to glorify God and to show others Jesus' love. Um, and I'll end with this quote that both deeply convicts me and encourages me to just keep running. Um, we shall have all eternity to celebrate the victories, but we have only the few hours before sunset in which to win them.